Uh, now, the news in Westminster is never slow, and while justice outside the Commons will dominate oral questions later today, justice within the Commons has dominated headlines with fresh allegations that Chris Pincher's behaviours had been raised with the Prime Minister as early as 2019. Well, let's get to the bottom of exactly what has been alleged now. I'm joined now by Sir Bob Neill, uh, Conservative MP for Bromley and Chislehurst, and of course Chair of the Commons Justice Committee. Uh, Sir Bob, thank you so much for joining us this morning morning. Uh, there's been a remarkable allegation posted on Twitter by uh, Simon MacDonald, the former uh, FCDO top uh, uh, official, who, who said that upon Chris Pincher's appointment as a foreign office minister back in the summer of 2019, there had been complaints within the foreign office. Those complaints had been investigated. Uh, Chris Pincher had apologised, promised to not uh, do whatever he did again. And crucially, that the Prime Minister was informed of that process at the time. Where does that leave number 10 now? I think it leaves it in a pretty hopeless position, frankly, Tom, um, because uh, this is yet again shifting sands, and it's one of the things that really has been concerning many of us for some time now, that there seems a complete inability uh, to uh, deal with what are pretty basic questions, and then stick to the same line. Uh, every time we seem to get a little bit of information put out, and then it has to be corrected or, or changed, or something else comes along. I think people are finding it very frustrating that why, for heaven's sake, can't number 10 just be straight about it? Mm. Is there a generous interpretation? of what went on here, of course. So there's been a debate over whether or not uh, the, the, the Prime Minister using the word resolved investigation exonerates him in terms of what sort of investigations he may well have been informed on, whether, whether he was informed on one that wasn't resolved, but he said he was not informed of any resolved ones, or, or could it be more simple than this? Could it be that the Prime Minister may well have been taken aside in the summer of 2019, and we all remember what the summer of 2019 was like with the whole uh, Brexit rigmarole, the, 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 the political system of this country teetering on the brink of collapse, the chaos in Parliament that we saw at that time. Could it be that the Prime Minister, in the midst of all of that, just didn't remember a conversation with a senior official at the Foreign Office and three years later didn't recall it and thought... He was telling the truth. That's not a defence I want to put forward in court as a barrister, Tom, frankly, um, uh, because you know, an allegation of that kind uh, about what was then a serving minister is, I think, even uh, in those times of pressure, something that you would think that would register. Um, I, I listened actually very carefully to what Lord MacDonald said uh, on the media this morning. And the really concerning thing is that uh, he maintains uh, that the Prime Minister had been told uh, and says, and asked, when asked, how do you know that? Uh, he said, well, the senior official who he spoke to assured him at the time that that had been said. So uh, either that senior official lied to Lord MacDonald or, or um, something has gone very badly wrong uh, in number 10. Uh, and uh, whatever the pressures, uh, I, I really don't think it stacks up that something like that could have been forgotten. And I think what's really frustrating for a lot of us, Tom, is that you've seen ministers like Will Quince and Therese Coffey both of whom you and I know and who are honest people mm. who've been sent out there and in good faith have told things which have now been uh, approved not to be the case. I think probably that applies to Dom Raab as well, uh, who in the middle of an interview uh, was told that the position had changed. I can actually believe Dom's point when he says, well, uh, actually Lord Donald tended to, to support him uh, when he said, well, it's perfectly possible uh, that the Foreign Secretary wouldn't know if the Prime Minister had been told directly because government is quite compartmentalised. Mm. But once it's gone in number 10, I think that's much, much harder to sustain, Tom. It's so interesting with all of the latest scandals involving number 10. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the fact of the appointment of Chris Pincher. It's not necessarily the fact of whether or not uh, the Prime Minister attended a leaving drinks for a valued colleague. Uh, it's about how it's been responded to and mm. the, the obfuscation around these events after the fact. I wonder, how does Number 10 crawl its, uh, pull its way back from this? I think it's going to be extremely hard, Tom. I mean, I, I've been pretty clear that I'm not satisfied with the leadership of the party anyway. Mm. Um, but it, there's two things that have come together here, uh, plus a third separate one. Uh, and the two things are, firstly, just not being straight with people. Um, and that does a fact impact trust. And at the end of the day, I think what we saw in those by-elections, but in the local election that I was very heavily engaged in locally, 
There's a lot, a lot of traditional conservative voters saying, oh, sorry, we just don't, don't trust uh, the government at the moment. And so that question, what you're honest or not about it, it goes to trust. The shambolic way in which it's been handled also goes to competence. And that drift moves in, I think, to the other concern many of us have about the government at the moment, is that there isn't a sense of drive, there isn't a sense of focus, there's a real sense of drift, and you see that in policy areas. You know, people say to me, well, actually, the level of taxation that we've got at the moment, one of the highest in 40-odd years, and the level of public debt, you know, I wouldn't mind. It's not even being very conservative either. And I think you put those three things together, for many conservatives, you've got a, a near-perfect storm, Tom. That is, that, that is such an interesting point, and it's something that comes up again and again in my conversations with your colleagues, which is that sort of were the economy going gangbusters, were everything sort of rosy on the policy front, uh, perhaps they'd be able to forgive the occasional resignation of some <clears throat> nefarious minister for an alleged deed. I, I, of course, this sort of stuff happened under previous prime ministers. I don't think there's a single prime minister in modern history who hasn't had to face these sort of, uh, whether they're sexual impropriety scandals or resignation scandals, all these sorts of things. But it's almost compounded by the fact that there's the lack of that positive story to tell. And I just wonder, is there any way the prime minister, and indeed the chancellor perhaps, could win back your confidence, Sir Bob, with a big announcement in terms of the economic direction of this country, with these promised economic COVID-style press conferences from the autumn, with a big tax cut, perhaps, with a bold Thatcherite agenda? Well, uh, I think on the policy side, cutting tax will be an obvious thing to do, reversing the national insurance increase, for example, if, if you've got a real squeeze, as I'm seeing in my constituency now, uh, with people uh, in that sort of the, the middle income uh, range, by and large, um, the obvious thing to do is to start cutting uh, taxation, and that particularly help those who are on lower wages. And I think we ought to be looking to be ambitious and reduce taxation beyond that uh, and looking at a deregulatory agenda. So there are things you could do in policy terms, but unfortunately thus far they seem to have been ruled out uh, by uh, Number 10 uh, and, and the Treasury. Um, but the other issue when it comes down to the Prime Minister's position is it's, it's easier to change policies than it is character. Uh, and I think that is the harder task uh, that, that uh, many of us at the moment find uh, very difficult to see how that can be achieved. Johnson was elected with an overwhelming majority amongst your colleagues and indeed amongst party members. Are we seriously trying to suggest that people didn't think this is sort of how Boris Johnson behaves normally, that of course you take the rough with the smooth, that he's, uh, uh, yes, sometimes clumsy, but ultimately uh, can win out in a big way in other areas. You sort of got two sides of the ledger there and, and, and clearly uh, getting Brexit done and a big vision for, for energising the country won out against the character flaws that I think no one would deny in the first place. I think it actually goes further than, uh, than that, Tom, because the, the level of what we're seeing now uh, it isn't clumsiness uh, and it isn't um, uh, the odd foible. Uh, this is a consistent pattern of, of poor conduct. Um, uh, and I'm afraid uh, when you look at Number 10 as an organisation, the lead for that pattern comes from the top. Uh, and I think, if you like, the joke on that side is, is it has gone from people. And then you add that to the fact that although there was an ambitious agenda and a lot of boosterish talk, Back to the point we were talking about earlier, precious little of it has actually happened on the ground. Certain exceptions, full credit to the government on uh, the vaccines rollout and full credit to, for what the government is doing in Ukraine. But in other areas, policy is largely stalled uh, and we're in a sense of drift. So I'm, I'm afraid that that, that generous explanation that, that, that doesn't hold water for me. And sadly, um, in, this, in politics, like many other things, you're as good as your last gig. Uh, and uh, what worked in 2019, an awful lot of the world has sadly moved on since then.